In this video, we are going to talk about a quantum algorithm for solving a system of linear equations. This algorithm is usually referred to as the HHL algorithm after its inventors, Harrell, Hasidim, and Lloyd. Solving a system of linear equations is a fundamental problem that arises in numerical computing all over the place. It is used in finding the best linear fit to data and numerically solving differential equations, and it's a key subroutine in many numerical optimization algorithms. Let us say we're given an n by n matrix A, which is invertible, and an n-dimensional vector B. I will usually refer to B as the right-hand side. The goal is to find an n-dimensional vector x such that A times x is equal to B. In this situation where A is invertible, such an x always exists and is unique. In fact, it is just A inverse times B. The familiar method we have all learned to solve a system of linear equations is Gaussian elimination. The running time of Gaussian elimination is of order n cubed when A is an n by n matrix. We know that the asymptotic complexity of solving a system of linear equations is actually better than this. A system of linear equations can be solved in the same amount of time, of order the same amount of time as it takes to do matrix multiplication. Now we haven't exactly pinned down the complexity of matrix multiplication yet. So we just de denote the exponent of its running time by a variable called omega. We know that matrix multiplication can be, so we say that the matrix multiplication can be done in time into the omega. And we know that omega is less than this number here, approximately 2.37, and is at least two, but we still don't know exactly what omega is. So both of these methods find the exact solution x. Now closer to the case we're going to look at for uh, quantum algorithms is where we just find an approximate solution. And there's various iterative methods that can be used to find approximate solutions. So in the approximate case, we want to find a vector x tilde that is close in L2 norm to the true solution x star. As an example of an iterative method, when A is positive definite, we can use the conjugate gradient method to find an epsilon approximate solution in time of the order of the number of non-zero entries of A times the square root of the condition number of A times log of one over epsilon. The condition number is the ratio of the largest eigenvalue of A to the smallest. And we're gonna talk more about the condition number shortly. This kind of bound brings us closer to what we will see in the quantum case. We will also talk about approximate solutions and the condition number will again play a role in the complexity. Now let's set up the quantum version of the problem. We assume that we are given access to an oracle that gives us the entries of an invertible matrix A. And we also are given a unitary that prepares the right-hand side vector B of the system of linear equations as a quantum state. Let us assume that the right-hand side vector is normalized to be a unit vector. So we have this unitary that prepares a quantum state where the amplitude on ket i, the ith basis state, is exactly the ith entry of b. Now the output in this quantum version of the problem is different than in the classical case, and this is a very important point. In the quantum case, the output is actually a quantum state, ket tilde x. We want that this quantum state encodes a vector that is close to the true solution, x star. And we again measure closeness in terms of L2 norm. So it's important to note that we do not explicitly produce a vector of dimension n at the, at the end of the algorithm. So at the end of the algorithm, we do not have all the entries of this approximate solution written, written down on a piece of paper. If we had to do that, the running time would automatically be at least n because you have to spend that much time just to write down a vector of dimension n. In this case, we just have to produce a log n qubit state. 
So this opens the possibility of having a running time that is actually less than n. Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd give a quantum algorithm for this problem that we're going to talk about today. This has become one of the fundamental quantum algorithms, and everybody refers to it as the HHL algorithm. Okay, so before we get into the algorithm, let's talk some more about the representation and access we have to the input. So we're going to assume that each row of the input matrix A has at most S non-zero entries. We are given two oracles to extract information from A. In the first oracle, OA here, we can query the IJ entry and get back AIJ, the, eighth, the IJth entry of A. The second oracle tells us about the locations of the non-zero entries in A. So we can query J and L, and it tells us the column number of the Lth entry of row J. For the right-hand side vector B, we assume that we have a circuit that can generate copies of the state encoding B. The algorithm will need to generate multiple copies of B. For arguing about the complexity, we assume that there's a quantum circuit to generate B that uses T sub B gates. Like the conjugate gradient method that we mentioned earlier, the quantum running time will depend on the condition number of the input matrix A. So let's talk some more about the condition number. We are additionally going to assume that the input matrix A is Hermitian, so all of its eigenvalues will be real. And remember, we assume that A is invertible, so it's not going to have any zero eigenvalues. So now let us sort the eigenvalues in terms of the, their absolute value from largest to smallest. Let sigma i be the absolute value of the ith eigenvalue in this sorted list. So sigma 1 is the spectral norm, the maximum absolute value of an eigenvalue, and sigma n is the absolute value of the smallest eigenvalue in, in terms of absolute value. And the condition number of a is the ratio of sigma 1 to sigma n. Okay, so here's a question for you. Assume that A is Hermitian and let lambda 1 through lambda n be its eigenvalues. What are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the inverse of A? So I'll give you a second to think about that. Okay, so the inverse of A will have the same eigenvectors as A, and the eigenvalues of the inverse of A will be the reciprocals of the eigenvalues of A. So vi will be an eigenvector of A inverse with eigenvalue 1 over lambda i. So this gives us another way to phrase the condition number. Because of this reciprocal relationship, the largest absolute value of an eigenvalue of the inverse of A will simply be 1 divided by the smallest absolute value of an eigenvalue of A. The largest absolute value of an eigenvalue of A is the spectral norm. So this says that the condition number is the spectral norm of A times the spectral norm of A inverse. Now let's try to get some more intuition about what the condition number means. The condition number can tell us about the following question. If we make a small relative change to x, how big of a relative change can this make to A times x? Okay, so let's see the relationship between the condition number and this question. Okay, so to address this question, we're going to use the optimization characterization of the spectral norm, which is given here at the top of the slide. The spectral norm can be written as the supremum over all unit vectors x of the L2 norm of A times x. Okay, so now say that we perturb x by delta x. We look at the relative change in a times x under this perturbation. So that is the norm of a times x plus delta x minus a times x, so that's the change, divided by the norm of a times x. And we normalize that whole quantity by the relative change in x, which is the norm of delta x divided by the norm of x. Okay, so when we see, simplify this expression, we see that it is the norm of a times delta x 
divided by the norm of delta x times the norm of x divided by the norm of a times x. So we can bound this by the norm of a times the norm of a inverse. In other words, we can bound this by the condition number. Now, this is just an upper bound, but from this reasoning, we expect matrices with high condition number to be poorly behaved in numerical computation with floating point numbers. So let me give you an example of this. So this is a bit of a personal story of how I found out how unstable numerical computations can be when working with poorly conditioned matrices. So I was working on the approximate degree of the AND function, and actually I wanted to find exactly what the best approximating polynomial looked like. So I was working a lot with polynomial interp interpolation. So to give an example of this, let's look at a kind of simplified example here where we just want to find a polynomial of degree five that represents the symmetrized and function on five bits. So we want to find a polynomial of degree five in a single variable that evaluates to zero at the integers zero, one, two, three, and four, and evaluates to one at five. Okay, so a degree five polynomial, it has six coefficients and we have six constraints here. So we can solve for these coefficients via a system of linear equations. We actually know by the constraint that p of zero equals zero that the constant term must be zero. So I've just dropped the constant term in showing you this system of linear equations here. So if you look at the matrix here, the first column is just the evaluation of x at the points one through five. The second column is the evaluation of x cubed at the points one through five etc. So this is just a basic polynomial interpolation problem, but the condition number of this matrix is terrible. So the condition number of this matrix is actually around 55,000. So when I encountered this, I was, I was really surprised. So I was surprised that for quite small values of n, like say n equals 10, you already start to run into very serious numerical problems when trying to solve a system of linear equations with this kind of matrix here. So by the way, as an aside, do you know how to get around this issue? So it turns out that the polynomials one x, x squared, they're just not a very good basis to work in for this kind of polynomial interpolation. To get a better condition number, you can switch to working with a better basis of polynomials. For example, a good basis to work in is the basis of Chebyshev polynomials. And this leads to a much better behaved system of linear equations. Okay, so here is the plan for today. First, we're gonna talk about how the HHL algorithm works. Then we'll talk about some applications of HHL so there are several conditions that are needed for the HHL algorithm to have good running time. And it can be difficult to find applications where all of these conditions are met. So we discuss some of these difficulties. And finally, we talk about quantum inspired classical algorithms. So the HHL algorithm has also now inspired new classical algorithms. So as I've mentioned, there are some assumptions that we need in order to efficiently implement the HHL algorithm. For example, we need to be able to efficiently prepare the right-hand side vector B. So quantum-inspired classical algorithms arose from trying to give a more fair quantum classical comparison. So what if we also gave the classical algorithms the same power we assume the quantum algorithm has in order to efficiently prepare this right-hand side vector, for example? So it turns out that this, this power can also really help classical algorithms. Okay, so there's three basic tools that go into the HHL algorithm. So those are Hamiltonian simula simulation, phase estimation, and amplitude amplification. So let me first talk about each of these tools. So the Hamiltonian simulation result that we're going to use is that if we have a matrix A, which is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n 
Hermitian matrix that is S sparse, so it has at most S entries per row, then we can implement e to the minus iat up to error epsilon in spectral norm with a number of queries of order s times t times the infinity norm of a plus some extra error term that depends on the approximation error epsilon. So here I, I'm using the infinity norm that is the largest magnitude of an entry of a. Okay, so this particular result is from the paper Optimal Hamiltonian Simulation by Quantum Signal Processing, and that's the archive identifier that I've given up there. Okay, so this is going to be the first ingredient in our explanation of the HHL algorithm. The next ingredient is phase estimation, which we have already talked about. So remember in phase estimation, there's a unitary u, and we're given an eigenvector v of u as a quantum state. And we assume that we can implement controlled power of u operations. The goal of phase estimation is to estimate the phase of the eigenvalue corresponding to v. So we want to estimate phi here. We know that the eigenvalue is of the form e to the 2 pi i times phi, and we want to estimate phi. Okay, so I'm showing you the basic circuit for phase estimation here. Before, when we talked about this, we just talked about exact phase estimation. So we actually assume that phi could be written exactly in n bits. In this case, with n controlled u operations, we were able to exactly recover phi by doing the circuit shown here in the picture and then applying the Fourier transform. So I didn't go through the details when we talked about phase estimation for the approximating case, but actually the same idea works to obtain an approximation of phi with good probability. So if you want an n-bit approximation of phi, we can again just apply this circuit above and do a Fourier transform to get an n-bit approximation of phi with good probability. Okay, so this is the second ingredient that we're going to need in the HHL algorithm. The third ingredient is amplitude amplification. So we actually haven't explicitly talked about amplitude amplification yet, but we have all the tools needed to understand it from our discussion of Grover's algorithm. The form of amplitude amplification that we'll need is the following. So say that we have a quantum algorithm A that on the all zero state produces the state alpha zero, ket zero, ket psi zero, plus alpha one, ket one, ket psi one. So you should think here that psi zero is the state that we're really after, and psi one is just some garbage. So at the end of the day, we would like to output psi zero. So assume that we have some lower bound P on the probability that when we measure the state A applied to the all zero state, um, the probability that when we measure we uh, the first qubit, we get zero. Then there is a quantum algorithm that makes order one over square root of P calls to A and A inverse and outputs psi zero with constant probability. So it produces the state uh, ket zero, ket psi zero with constant probability. So notice that if we just did the naive thing of repeatedly applying A to the all zero state and measuring the first register, we would have to repeat that order one over P times an expectation in order to, to obtain this state ket, si, ket zero, ket psi zero. So with amplitude amplification, we can obtain a quadratic speed up over this naive algorithm um, of just preparing A times the all zero state and measuring and repeating that. Okay, so now we actually have all the ingredients for the HHL algorithm. So let's go ahead and go through how it works. I will assume that A is normalized so that its spectral norm is one. And we use kappa for the condition number of A. So this means that all the eigenvalues of A have magnitude at least one over kappa. Now let V1 through Vn be an orthonormal set of eigenvectors for A where the eigenvalue corresponding to vj is lambda j. 
So then we can write A as the sum of J over lambda J times VJ times VJ conjugate transpose. And similarly, we can write A inverse as the sum over J of one over lambda J times VJ times VJ conjugate transpose. So we can also write the right-hand side vector B in the eigenbasis of A. So say that B is the sum over J of beta J times VJ. It's important to note that the algorithm does not actually need to know these coefficients. We just work in the eigenvector basis for our analysis. Now the state that we want to obtain at the end of the day that should be proportional to A inverse times B. So it should be proportional to the state sum over J, beta J divided by lambda J times ket VJ. So we want to obtain a state which is proportional to that. Now we can't just apply A inverse directly to B as A inverse might not be a, a unitary operation. But e to the i a is unitary, and it has the same eigenvectors as a and a inverse. Plus, we can implement e to the i a and its powers using Hamiltonian simulation. So this means we can do phase estimation on e to the i a. So we're going to analyze what the algorithm does to a particular eigenvector vj. By linearity, then we know what it will do to any state in the eigenbasis of A. And we're, we're going to apply this, this, this procedure that I'm going to describe next to the right-hand side vector B. OK, so we're going to have three registers in our state. We start out in the state VJ, tensor 0, tensor 0. First, we do phase estimation on E to the IA with the eigenvector VJ. So for this high-level overview, let's just suppose that this works perfectly. And so we get the state vj tensor lambda j tensor 0. In reality, of course, we can't afford to exactly get the eigenvalue lambda j here. So the algorithm will still work if we just get an estimate theta j such that uh, theta j minus lambda j in absolute value is at most epsilon over kappa. Okay, so to get this kind of estimate, we're going to have to apply e to the ia to the power kappa over epsilon. So by the Hamiltonian simulation result that we just talked about, we can get this kind of estimate in time roughly s, the sparsity of a, times kappa divided by epsilon. Okay, good. So now that we have lambda j in the second register, we are going to do a rotation conditioned on the value of lambda j to the third register. So we would like to just put amplitude 1 over lambda j on ket 0 in this rotation. That, I mean, that is the eigenvalue of, of A inverse corresponding to vj. But that might not be a valid amplitude because you know, it could be larger than 1 in magnitude. So we need to have this normalizing factor of kappa. We know that kappa times the magnitude of lambda j is at least 1. So 1 divided by kappa times lambda j will be a valid amplitude. OK, so we do this rotation so that we have amplitude 1 divided by the quantity kappa times lambda j on the 0 state, and the rest of the amplitude is on the 1 state. So then in step four, we're going to undo the phase estimation and drop the second register. So we're left with the state that we have at the bottom of the slide. So now we're actually set up to do amplitude amplification. So it's the part of the state where the second register is zero that we want to amplify. That's the part that we want. So, so far, we've just been looking at the application of the algorithm to a single eigenvector. But by linearity, we can see what it does to the right-hand side vector b itself. So let's go ahead and do that now. So when we do this, we see that when the second register is 0, we have something proportional 
to A inverse times B, which is exactly what we want. When the second register here is one, we just have some garbage that we don't care about. So I'm just going to um, you know, write that that's phi uh, tensor one, but we, we don't really care what that is. So in order to see what happens in amplitude amplification, we have to estimate the magnitude of the amplitude on the part of the state where the second register is zero. So because we assume that the spectral norm of A is one, all of the lambda squareds are at most one. So therefore the sum of beta J squared over lambda J squared is at least one. That means that the norm on the part of the state with zero in the second register is at least one over the condition number kappa. Okay, so now we have a lower bound on the probability that we, when we measure the state, we see zero, and we can use this to see how many rounds of amplitude amplification we have to do. So the probability that when we measure, we see, when we measure the second register that we see zero is at least one over kappa squared. So that tells us that doing one over kappa rounds of ampli amplitude amplification and measuring the second register, we will obtain a state proportional to the solution A inverse B with constant probability. Okay, so that's actually the whole algorithm. Okay, so now let's go ahead and analyze its complexity. So the first four steps of the algor algorithm can be done with roughly kappa times S divided by epsilon many queries to A and order log n times kappa times s divided by epsilon plus tb many other gates. Okay, so that's just the first four steps of the algorithm, but we have to repeat that order kappa many times for the amplitude amplification. Okay, so the total cost is that cost per round multiplied by kappa. Okay, so I've described a relatively simple version of HHL here. So the result can be improved in several ways. You can reduce the one over epsilon dependence to log one over epsilon. And you can use a more sophisticated form of amplitude amplification to make the kappa dependence linear. And you can achieve both of these improvements simultaneously. So I give the archive references here for these improvements if you want to learn more about that. Okay, so here's the complexity again. And the most notable thing here in the complexity is the n dependence. So the dependence on n is only logarithmic. So we have actually achieved what we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Since we don't explicitly output an n-dimensional vector, but just a log n qubit quantum state, we said that we can hope to achieve sublinear complexity in n. And indeed, we have done that. We've actually gotten log n uh, dependence on n. So the terms that are really going to depend on the application of HHL and tell you whether or not you can use HHL to get a speed up or not are these other terms of kappa, s, and tb. So let me make a couple of remarks about the algorithm. So you don't actually need to assume that A is S sparse. All you need is some assumption that implies efficient Hamiltonian simulation. So you can replace the S sparse condition with anything that implies this. So the second remark is that this problem is actually BQP complete. So estimating the first entry of A inverse times B for a constantly sparse matrix A is a BQP complete problem. So we don't actually expect to be able to classically simulate this algorithm. So the HHL algorithm has been enormously influential, especially for the rapidly developing field of quantum machine learning. But actually, in my opinion, we still haven't found any killer applications of HHL. So there's still a lot of active discussion about this, about the implications of HHL, especially for quantum machine learning. So here are some references where you can read more about this. 
Um, and these references both span the more optimistic and the more pessimistic sides of this debate. Okay, so what are the difficulties in finding applications of HHL? So in my opinion, there are three difficulties. The first is that you have to be able to efficiently prepare copies of the right-hand side vector B. So you need an application where you can naturally do this. So this especially leads to a problem in applications where B is represented by classical data. If you have to read the entries of B, this is already going to take time, at least in, and your exponential speed up is gone. The next difficulty is that at the end of the day, we just have a quantum state representing the solution to our systems, to our system of linear equations. So to make this useful, we need to have an application where we can quickly e extract the desired information from this quantum state. So for example, where there's you know, a measurement that we can do on X that gives us the information that we want. So I mean, suppose that we just want to compute some property of X, maybe something like the expectation of some positive semi-definite operator on X. If this expectation value is P, it can naively take you one over epsilon squared times P many preparations of X in order to get an estimate of P uh, that has error at most epsilon times P. So if P is small, you know, this can also take you a long time. There have been some results on, on speeding this up using amplitude estimation, but that only gives a quadratic speed up. So to really take advantage of the HHL speed up, you need to find an application where the information that you want from about the solution can be extracted from this quantum state efficiently. So the third difficulty is the dependence on the condition number. So to prove a rigorous bound on the complexity of your application using which uses HHL, you're going to need to prove upper bounds on the condition number of the matrices involved. And this can be difficult. So this is especially true if you don't explicitly don't explicitly know the matrices that will arise in your application on which you're going to be applying HHL. So a really nice example of this, which I think still presents an interesting open problem, is in this paper, a quantum interior point method for LPs and STPs. So here's a slide that I've taken from Yuan Tang's talk um, so here's the YouTube link for the talk, so I recommend checking it out. So these are various problems for which quantum algorithms with potential speedups have been proposed. And the color here indicates you know, how good a candidate this was believed to be for an exponential speedup at the time of its proposal. So one to focus on here is in the bottom right corner, the application to recommendation systems by Karanidis and Prakash. So this was a really nice example where all of the assumptions needed for an efficient HHL algorithm were met in a natural way. And the application was to a very interesting real world problem. So Yuan Tang showed in the paper a quantum inspired classical algorithm for recommendation systems that looking at a more fair apples to apples comparison, that the quantum recommendation system example actually does not offer an exponential speed up over the classical case. So the key to this is a certain assumption made about the ability of the quantum algorithm to access the right-hand side vector B, basically what kind of access the quantum algorithm had to the right-hand side vector B. So in this uh, paper, in order to prepare B as a quantum state, it was assumed that one could efficiently estimate the L2 norm of certain subvectors of B. So I'm going to explain more about this on the next slide. So it turns out that that was actually quite that's actually quite a strong primitive. And Yuan Tang observed that 
giving a classical algorithm that primitive could lead to very efficient classical algorithms as well. So this result quickly led to many other quantum-inspired classical algorithms for all the problems shown in purple here. So these are no longer good candidates for an exponential quantum speedup. So let's talk about this issue of how to repair the right-hand side vector B as a quantum state. So Karanidis and Prakash pr proposed a generic way of doing this, provided one can efficiently determine the L2 norm squared of some subsequences of the vector B. So I've, I've demonstrated this with an example here. So look at the tree on the left. So at the root, we have one, which is the L2 norm squared of the whole vector. So I'm using as an example, the vector phi here, which you can see at the top of the box in, in green. So at the root of this tree, we have one, which is the L2 norm squared of the whole vector. The children of the root show the L2 norm squared of the part of the vector that where the first qubit is zero, so that's 0.32, and the part of the vector where the first qubit is one, and that's 0.68. Then in the next level of the tree, we have the L2 norm squared of the part of the state with first two qubits 0, 0, then 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, respectively. Okay, so if you can actually access B in such a way that you can compute all the numbers of this tree, then that gives you an efficient way to prepare B as a quantum state. Okay, and this is what Karnidis and Prakash were using. So, in the recommendation systems paper, it was assumed that one had query access to B to, to allow one to compute all the numbers in this tree in order to efficiently prepare B. So Yuan Tang's idea was to give the same query access to classical algorithms in order to really have a fair apples to apples comparison between the quantum and classical cases. So more formally, here's the model, which is called sampling plus query access. So it allows one to sample entries of the vector with probability proportional to the magnitude squared of the entry. That's the first item. It allows one to query entries of V, and it allows one to query its norm. Again, one can similarly define sampling plus query access to a matrix, uh, which allows sampling plus query access to each row of, of the matrix and to the vector of its row norms. So there are many quantum-inspired classical results by now, but I'll just show you one of them just to illustrate the flavor. So this is going to use a slightly different number than the condition number, which is denoted by kappa f here. So that's the Frobenius norm of A times the spectral norm of the inverse of A. So this result then says that if we have sampling plus query access to B and an S sparse matrix A, then there's a classical algorithm that can actually output an X tilde that is close to A inverse times B in time S times kappa F, kappa F squared times log one over epsilon. Okay, so now we're actually getting a bound that's of quite a similar flavor to the HHL algorithm.